this work session of the Silver Falls School Board to order. Um, thank you everyone for coming. It's nice to see a good audience again. Um, just for clarification, for the audience, we don't have public comment during our work sessions. It's just a time for the board to get together and chat. So um, any thoughts that come up, you can send us emails or wait till the next regular session to come and speak publicly. So, um, to get things rolling, we have a few items on our consent agenda tonight. Is there a motion for approval? Move for approval. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Consent agenda passes. On to discussion items. Use of Schlater Street Campus as a school site. Andy had a couple things in our packet. Um, copies of the PowerPoint from the last meeting. Um, maps of the campus. Andy, do you want to start off with any new information you have? And yeah, I don't know. old information? So there's so much new information, but I can, I can highlight a couple of things that may be helpful for your discussion and consideration. Uh, I'll first, refer you to uh, to this document. You each one of you received a map of uh, the footprint of the Schlater campus. It doesn't reflect uh, <coughs> two two story portions, uh, uh, like an elevation design, but it does uh, does show you the, the basic footprint of the campus uh, on one page, uh, and then on the second page, uh, in, in outline form is the two and three story portion that is uh, facing Schlater Street and then also in, in dotted line outline form is the, uh, the former ag shop uh, wood shop and those those were the two areas that uh, I know Wally had mentioned at the last board meeting it was part of the conversation uh, in in subsequent follow or excuse me subsequent conversation uh, with you and Julie had the question about what the current uses of those portions of the building were uh, and I can briefly describe that the the original two and three story portion is uh, is designated as educational storage uh, it's it, essentially, if you were to walk through there, nearly every one of those classrooms is empty, with the exception of a couple of classrooms, in, if you're familiar with the old layout of the old, old high school and the business wing, where, where there must be uh, a two or three hundred student desks in there, uh, and uh, some tables, and uh, a few other items that we, we, we kept uh, from the Schlater campus that still have some value uh, and, and could be used in the future for, for, for uh, school. Uh, otherwise, the, that portion of the building sits empty. Uh, the um, multi-purpose room is also designated as storage, as is uh, the classrooms that are inside, uh, inside the, um, uh, or do not have access from the outside. The, the, the two or three classrooms you can see them here. It's it's designated classrooms. Uh, it's on the bottom right of the of the uh, illustration. Classrooms. It says classroom C2, classroom D1, classroom D2. Uh, the classroom D1 and D2 are actually outside of the main structure, those last two classrooms. So they, by definition, are not decommissioned. But everything uh, west of there and inside the former two and three story, or high school, the two and three story portion is decommissioned in its educational storage. Uh, and then if you move to uh, the center, uh, the center portion of the illustration it says uh, uh, ag metal shop constructed in 1941, wood shop constructed in 1961. Uh, those uh, are are used uh, currently. Uh, that the old ag shop is used predominantly for van storage. Uh, it's as much as anything a convenience because it's large, it has two double doors, and you can drive vans in and out of there. So it's been nice to have to be able to keep the vans out of the rain. Uh, otherwise, How are the roofs leaking pretty bad? The roofs leaking pretty bad. Yeah, yeah but the, the blue tarp up there is pretty evident. Um, the um, uh, the wood shop uh, is the former high school wood shop, and, and it was constructed obviously uh, 20 years later, based upon this uh, information. Uh, and the wood shop is is used uh, periodically in any given week by our district wide maintenance. Uh, employee uh, Gerald uh, Jensen, uh, and so there are still some uh, some uh, wood tools in there: table saw, radio alarm saw, uh, a couple of workbenches, and things like that. Uh, uh, I want to direct your attention to the upper center portion, and it says uh, Auto Shop 1969. 
and that was the, again the former auto shop of Silverton High School. That's currently the uh, the grounds shop, uh, and and that is also used. Uh, actually, that's used more extensively than, than the ag or the wood shop. That's used on a daily basis as the office for two employees. Uh, and and it, it, it's it's my belief that uh, in fact there is there's sufficient room in the old auto shop uh, if you were to remove uh, the wood shop and the old egg shop uh, there is sufficient room in the old auto shop for the addition of those wood shop tools and and for the, that to be a maintenance a combined groundskeeping maintenance shop uh, for uh, any future years so. Uh, based upon the conversation at the last meeting and and, uh, and Wally's proposal, those would be the, the two items that would be removed, potentially removed, would be the center two and three story portion and then the old ag shop. And those were also uh, considerations, or not considerations, they were part of the planning efforts uh, for uh, the, the last bond uh, in, uh, in, in May of 13, uh, part of the efforts with uh, conversion of the Schlater campus at that time. Okay, so there you go. I know we've had a lot of discussion about um, the use of Schlater K3 versus a junior high. So we can talk about that tonight. And then also uh, tied into this is, is Wally's, the proposal Wally brought last time to give a little more direction to the scope of the bond. Um, certainly not the total scope, but just give a little more direction of the way, we're, the way we as a board want to move. And we said last at the meeting last week that we would make that an action item tonight. So I'm just going to read those real quick before we start our discussion. Um, give the district direction to develop scope and cost for a projected bond potentially targeted for the November election that would include the following. Remove the old three-story section of the Schlesinger campus. Remove the Ag Science Building, remodel and upgrade the remaining single-story structures on the Schlater Street Campus, infill the Schlater Street Campus with new construction to provide new educational space, provide safety and security upgrades at all of the district school buildings that are used for students per our consultants' reports, provide technology updates in our buildings. So that is going to, those proposals are going to be an action item later. Um, I'll start <laughs> since I got some, something fresh in my mind right now. Um, I like these proposals. I think I think we, in my opinion, we should adopt those tonight because I think I think we're using the Schlater campus for some purpose, whether that be a K three or a junior high, is a great idea. We already have that asset. I think it's a good idea to use that. Um, I need to, and I think. I think we need to nail down more cost figures before we can decide what that what that's going to be for sure. You know, looking at volumetric construction and and um, all that kind of thing. We need to because I know because we need to keep a we need to really watch the dollars on the bond. You know, in my mind, we need to keep it under mil, under twenty million. But um, but that you know, it all come, a lot of it comes down to dollars. So I don't think we're there yet where we can decide the specific use of that building. But I think these proposals give really good direction in kind of where we're moving. So, and I think it's you know we have that asset over there. It's a shame to let it sit there. So as we decide at the last meeting to close Eugene Field, I think one of the <coughs> options we talked about you know for the Schlater is. The way we should go, but I just think these give really good direction. They're pretty clear. Should we specify in there whether we want them, want them to look at it as K three or six seven eight? I uh, purposely left that vague because I didn't think we were ready to decide that yet. I thought we could talk about just creating space, dollars per square foot, square foot okay. numbers, and try to get our arms around what what the cost is per the various scope items. <clears throat> that should be about the same then. I would expect it would be. Okay. What about student? Uh, how many students would be in that building? Should we put a number on that? I would have heard. It depends whether it's a K three or a six. Yeah. K three, you're going to have, you know, four grades. Six eight, you're going to have three. Right. So right. Right. Could be 150. Hey, yeah. Difference there. And that's kind of what I'm getting at because it makes a lot. The site makes a lot more sense than six seven eight. Long term, you know. Mm -hmm. well, part of you know, yeah, and then it, it yeah. I think we come come with metrics, get get some ideas around scope and dollars per square foot. We can we can kind of modulate based on 
Just to the discussion. That might, just might, that might even help our discussion down the road to decide yeah. if we're going to do a K3 or a 6-8. Yeah, what about, what about earthquake standards? Because a lot of this area is older buildings. You know, should we, we should probably bring those up to code, the older, the older buildings, because... That'd, you know, that'd be part it, of the remodel cost. Yeah, Correct. but it, but it would be bringing them up to current code. That's my okay. expectation. Okay. Okay. I think we'd be forced to. If I'm not, I may be incorrect there, but I think yeah. we'd be forced to. Yeah, I'm just making sure that we got it covered. And did you have a comment? Oh, sorry. No, 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 go ahead, Tom. Did you have a comment on the numbers in? Uh, I, I was only going to comment that the the actual enrollment numbers is partially based upon what the programming of the building is. Yeah. If, if, yeah. We, if we put three or four district wide special education programs in there, that the the enrollment. The enrollment is going to be different than if it was if there were no not or non special ed programs or ELL programs, etc. So uh, that would all come out with um, with that refinement of that determination. Okay. So this is just a quick, you know, it's kind of a. Well, I don't think it's quick. It, it's there's not. A, there's yeah. a lot. There's a lot of work to be done there. That's kind of what I'm getting at. Yes. If we're going to have any possibility of hitting a November um, bond, there's a lot of work that needs to be done because. We throw around a lot of numbers, but we don't know yeah. really what we're talking about yet. Right, right. Yeah, I guess I, I just know that that site makes much more sense as a six, seven, eight, and so I would I would be, you know, as much details as we can give these folks. Oh, of course. We're yeah. going to nail it down, you know. Yeah, so I, would, I, don't, I don't know if that's too much detail to put in this document, but that's what we should be doing, I think, you know, to get the get, get that think, number as quickly as we can. Yeah, I think we need to get numbers as quickly as we can, but I think for this document, I think it's, in my mind, it's better just to keep it general for educational purposes, just rather okay. than, just because I don't think we're there yet. Yeah, I, I don't I, think we have the, all the information we need to nail down mm -hmm. exactly what we're going to do. I really think getting the numbers will help guide us to cut our future conversations, too. Okay. I, I like this because, you know, I still, once in a while, I still hear people say, why are you putting kids back in the Schlater building. And this this is a something that says no we're removing that old you know yeah. like we're just laying a few things out. Sure. Sure. So and anybody else? Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is an idea that was broached at the the decision decision-making meeting uh, to close Eugene Field, but one of the things that concerns me here is we have a very aggressive timeline for a bond proposal. And now that we've made the decision to close Eugene Field, um, it seems to me that we should consider other potential options that might actually be cost-effective and educationally sound uh, for the district rather than just go forward without exploring those options uh, with something at this later sh street sh site. I mean, I, I realize that there's been a lot of talk about that for a long time, but I'm not, I'm not certain and I'm not convinced that that's the best option. And so the idea, as you probably all recall, that was floated last time is the possibility of not building another building and thereby saving that expense, uh, reconfiguring attendance boundaries in the district and adding on to Robert Frost, which is already designed for additional space to be built, and then looking at other strategic rural elementary schools and adding on to those schools uh, that would require changing attendance boundaries, but attendance boundaries are routinely changed in most school districts. And I, I bring that up all the time because uh, Salem-Kaiser does it as a matter of public policy every two years. It's automatic. And, uh, it's, it's a new concept here to do that on such a regular basis, but um, it's the most effective way to manage the student population in your buildings. And I would like to see, and, and thereby maximize uh, the use of those buildings. So I'd like to see us talk about, at least talk about that option. So it's something that we haven't talked about prior, and it's something that I, I personally think we should explore. Yeah, I... Um I know I've kind of groused a little bit because we haven't had our strategic visioning process done to kind of help guide us on a lot of this stuff. And that, but on what we have had is there was some statement in there about most teachers in the district agree that straight grade education provides better teaching environment. And we've got all these new standards coming down the, down the pike, and that is you know 
that that's a real possibility, you know, that we could get some straight grades in, in all these mixed grade buildings and um, maybe some better instructional results. Is a, it, it's a possibility. I don't know what it would cost to add on to all these little buildings. Is, is that, you know, how do we explore that? Is there, is there, a, way, is there a way to find out that, now I, I know that moving attendance boundaries is definitely controversial, I, I get that. But is there a way to say, boy, there's a lot of money to be saved, is it worth it? You know, is, is there a way to get some numbers on what that would cost to do at some of, at some of these outlying, outlying buildings? Would we, re would we really add on to all the outlying, so say we went ahead and did that, would we really want to go add on to some of these outlying buildings or just fill them to capacity using David's scenario? It may be that, yeah, I don't know. Um, it would just be, I don't know. A lot of the buildings are at capacity already. That's that's one yeah. of my concerns. Is a lot of a lot of our buildings are already at capacity, yeah. very close to it. And um, one thing that that I remember from the long range facilities task force meetings a couple of years ago is people in the community liked things the way they were. They didn't want to see change. They didn't want to see ch see change. They liked the people in the cades liked their cades. They um, the people in town liked the transitions between the schools and nobody wanted you know people didn't want to see, see change which you know doesn't mean doesn't mean you shouldn't do it but but if it's if it's not broke why fix it I guess it's part of my thinking also yeah so um, and I think it'd be you know if you could add add one pod of Robert Frost but it depends how many grades you're talking about putting there that's one pod is enough for one grade you're talking about putting nine. I know was, there was talk of a K five. Well, that'd be a huge school. It'd be seven or eight hundred kids in a school, and that's. I think that's too big of a school for a K five. So, I'm just concerned about the numbers and I mean the student populations. And Andy, did you you had sent us an email was it last week with the available spaces in the in the out oh, kids. Yeah, on schools. Based upon the current enrollment. Yeah. Yes. And what, what I can't remember what that was. One. Uh, and I, I don't have that in front of me. I think I think it was around 100 and, 170 uh, available slots. You, you, have, you currently have five schools that that are at or very near capacity uh, of your eight rural schools, uh, and uh, and so you, you do have room for like I said about 170, uh, and that's. And that's not giving any consideration to availability of grades. I, I know for a fact you have at least six schools that are full in the second and third grade right now already for next year. Uh, and so if you know if, if you were to uh, adjust attendance boundaries and, and move students out and, and not do any construction, you you don't have the room for that. I mean, it would require some form of construction yes. if that's something that you were uh, you were you were interested in doing. And, and uh, or deny transfers. Uh, or, or deny transfers. Yeah, you're right. You're, That'd be a pretty big hammer too. But we can, you know. Yeah, you you gain about 100, and I think it's around 180 students net. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and again, similar to uh, attendance boundary changes, that's that's an emotionally driven topic and, and something that uh, mm -hmm. surely has some risk associated with. Transportation would be a long time issue as well. Yeah. 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 I just don't know if there's is there potential to save money on construction by that by that route. You know, I know that, you know, is it, you know, straight grade instruction, trying to get to some, sure. you know, we got some high standards coming down the line, right. some common core standards, and uh, we want to maintain our, our high test scores. Depends on what you had to do. I would yeah. think it would be fairly expensive to add on any, to any buildings, you know. Yeah. So I don't know why it wouldn't cost any less to add on at Butte Creek than it does at, Mark, at Robert Frost or... I don't know. Right. Yeah, I don't know. Are there other buildings, you know, that are more ready to go than others? <clears throat> I, I don't know. I just think it'd be an interesting proposition. And then, do you, do you add on to an Evergreen or a Pratum? You know, there's yeah. I don't know. I imagine I imagine yeah. some have it's better attributes to add on than others. But I just I just the, the idea of having straight grade, you know, mm -hmm. our teachers were saying straight grade is better instructions. So if I could just jump back in here, I, I don't think it makes sense at all to consider adding on any additional space to some of our buildings. They're just not set up for that. They're too old. Um, for example, uh, Evergreen. I mean, it's a beautiful historic building, but and it's still functional, but it doesn't make sense to add on to that school in my mind. But schools like uh, Victor Point, 
or Scotts Mill School, uh, both of which have space, adequate land surrounding them. And, um, it, and that was a major issue with the decision to close Eugene Field, is the amount of space that was available to students for mm -hmm. play oh, area, for space. parking, uh, for all that stuff, and traffic. So if you have, you have those schools that are relatively modern that um, you can add on to at lower cost and achieve something uh, really good educationally for the kids. And I think that it's kind of, um, it's pretty obvious. We haven't done the research yet, which I think we should do, obviously, but we haven't done the research yet, but it seems like kind of a no-brainer to me that you're not going to have the systems development charges and all of those related costs in a uh, setting like Victor Point or Scotts Mills uh, that you're going to have with the Slater Street site. That's going to be tremendously expensive in terms of the town of Silverton uh, system development costs, traffic uh, costs, and all that stuff. So you're just going to have to deal with Marion County um, and the other sites. So just. Just, no, I mean, yeah, I don't know. That's, that, sounds, that makes it sound really small. I don't yeah, mean to minimize it, it because Marine County is Marine County. But, um, I just had uh, to throw that yeah, one out. Yeah, well, that's, 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 that's valid. But, yeah. um, I mean, it's, you it's know. To, to jump on that a little bit, but just to think, I don't know. Silverton, it seems to be that our population, student population growth is increasing in town. And at some point, the, the in-town schools are getting big and big. And big. When, when do you say these schools are too big? And when do we split them up? When do we do that? The Tom, it's also increasing in the outline schools. Victor Point has been increasing, yeah. and not from transfers, it's from moving. Yeah. Butte Creek yeah. has, how many more kids do they have than they started yeah. with this year? Yeah, about 15, I think. Yeah, they, yeah. Have, they have a fair amount more kids yeah. than when they started the year, and that's not from transfers. That's yeah, from no, I know. I, it's, so, it, it's just that question of how big is, you know, you know, is it time to say our in-town schools are now big enough and we need to stop, you know, either build another school in town or continuing to let them expand? I just What's think, the best I educational just think, size? Yeah. You know? I just think logistically with 170 spaces available, where are you going to move the kids? That's my... Well, new construction. Yeah, you have to. New construction. New construction. And I don't know if you need to, I don't know if there's system in develop, if you, you know, add in a couple... A couple class, you know, four classrooms here and there. If they, I don't know what Marion County wants you to provide for system and development. And do you got to provide more cafeteria space, or is it just simple classrooms? Mm -hmm. it, it might be a cheap alternative. I don't, I don't know. It might be politically dynamite. I don't know. But it, you know, I, I'd like to know what the co I'd like to know if we can have a you know a rough idea of what the cost would be. Changing boundaries and putting a whole school up in town to the outlying outside the schools in the country, you know, is going to be the transportation alone, the dynamic change there is something that would be an ongoing cost and one that would go up because there's a lot of kids in town that are walking to school. I, I don't know, I just think the idea that you're shipping kids really far away from where they're actually located at might not be a great solution for. I don't think it'd be any more popular with parents in town than it would be with parents in the outline schools. Yeah. Well, I don't think we were. Yeah, I, I, I don't think. I just don't I, don't. I don't. I can't see it. Well, I don't think we were. I don't think the proposal was to. to one of the one of the emails said, "Add the add the pod to Robert Frost." And if you know, maybe add a little bit up to Mark Twenty. I don't, I don't even know if that's possible. But then you know, fill those expansions. You know, make, make Robert Frost a K-5, a 678, then everything else, boundaries, you know, take care of, take care of the rest. Yeah, yeah, no, you've told us, how many students would a new pod at Robert Frost have? About 150. If, if it was fully uh, added to mm -hmm. six classrooms. So about one grade. One. Yeah, one, one grade, roughly. How easy is that to do up there? Does, does, does doing something like that bring with it a bunch of SDCs? 
uh, you, you've received the figures on what the anticipated range of costs would be to add six classrooms to Robert Frost. Okay. And I'd have to look back at that document. I could, but it's, it's in a, somewhere in all uh, uh, It's <laughs> full, full six classrooms with an addition of cafeteria, which would be necessary. Yeah, you have have if you're talking about uh, you know, yeah. six, 600, 700, 800 students, especially if you were to add more than six classrooms, see, you would require that. Robert Frost doesn't have a cafeteria. It has a gymnasium. Right. Right. Similar to Eugene Field that they feed students in and use for, for PE purposes. So cafeteria would be a, a requirement as would an additional covered play area uh, there of some sort. Uh, you would think there are at least some options for consideration. Yeah. Of so so we, we have taken a look at that. The city has, has told us that there would likely be minimal um, uh, traffic impact fees required if we were to expand Robert Frost. Uh, but um, uh, that, that hasn't had a full traffic impact study. And again, those kind of studies are very expensive and it's something yeah. we, we do once, once a plan is, is, yeah. is, is done and, and moving forward. Yeah. I, I just I like the idea of some more straight grade instruction in, in the district. I think we get some better results with the new standards coming. I remember discussions uh, on straight grades and also on school size in our, in size in our long range <coughs> so many task force meetings and the number of six hundreds. Uh, we were talking about okay, do you go with really large schools? Is that you know efficient from an efficiency standpoint? Does it make sense? How does that impact the educational programs? Um, and it seemed like that the national, and I'm kind of going on memory here, but the, the research had suggested that about 600 is about as big as you want to go in an elementary school before you start to see the negatives outweighing the positives of efficiency and things like that. Um, then I, I also remember talking about you know, evidence for the straight grades versus the um, you know, mixed grades, because at least anecdotally, that's been, you know, straight grades seem to be um, better for educational uh, purposes, and, and certainly probably in some subjects more important than others. But I think that the evidence, and Andy, you may remember better, that you know, Linda tried to compile, you know, how did the kids do in, you know, once they get to the high school, because we've got really a comparison that we can, we can look at. And it doesn't seem like there's a significant difference, really. Um, some of your blended, some differences. blended classroom schools actually do better uh, in, in <laughs> routinely year after year than, than the straight grade classrooms. But then again, there are multiple variables with that as well, of course. Yes. Uh, but um, uh, you, you're correct. There, there, we, we did look at a, a white paper and, and was provided to each of you at the time of the, uh, uh, the Long Range Facility Planning Committee discussing the, 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 that sort of a, a tipping point between when a, a, a student achievement, or at least the, the bulk of the, the research showed that student achievement was impacted uh, in, uh, or at least equalized when it came to uh, a size of school. And that 600 number is was pretty standard in most of the research. You get much bigger than that. Uh, and, and most schools find it difficult to maintain the uh, the academic achievement of, of students without a lot of extra uh, effort or, or even money. Uh, for that matter with the big schools, uh, I realize that some schools, Salem Kaiser is one of them, has middle schools of seven, eight, nine hundred students. Even I think Whitaker at one time was over a thousand, uh, but they they made concerted efforts to reduce those by constructing new schools in Salem Kaiser to to get closer to that six hundred uh, student point. Uh, the um, the, the other point I, I'd like to make, and I think it's uh, very important to, to remember, is that um, uh, you, uh, you have, uh, over the course of the last three years, have tasked two, two groups of community individuals to give you as much helpful information as possible to make distinctions about what would be as effective as possible in this district. And, and while I don't have the recommendations from 2012 in front of me, there were multiple recommendations that were based upon uh, 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 input from that task force, uh, uh, community input that you had received uh, about what is, what is I, I'll use the phrase, the best fit for the district. Well, it's not perfect. Uh, and one community was definitely going to value something differently than another, uh, but taking into account all of the information from a cross-section, I'm just thinking especially that 2012 committee, uh, cross-section of every community that you have in this school district about the values that they place on on uh, uh, their, their education and, and the value of, 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 or the need for change is based upon what we currently have. And what I recall about those recommendations, which you approved as a board, uh, were the, the, the need to, uh, uh, or the value of, of maintaining an, uh, all of your schools, 
uh, the value of maintaining the K-8 uh, grade configuration, uh, the value of, uh, of not being uh, disruptive uh, to the education of students, if at all possible, and seeing if you can maintain as much of the, uh, of the current status of schools as possible. Now, while there is entirely merit, David, you're correct. I mean, school districts change attendance boundaries. Some do it very routinely. Uh, this school district, not so often, but I think we can all agree uh, that something like attendance boundary changes is emotionally charged. And in and, and a case in point, when, when, when Monitor School was closed and, that, and the attendance boundaries were adjusted in the north part of your district, uh, or when Bethany School was closed a number of years ago and those attendance boundaries were changed, uh, adjusted, uh, for that size of an attendance boundary adjustment, that took the lion's share of the school year. Mm -hmm. And so if you're talking about district-wide attendance boundary changes, uh, I'll, I'll ask you to give uh, serious consideration to, to the time it would take in order to, to, to uh, charge another task force, to bring people together. Uh, and you're probably talking, in my opinion only, uh, potentially a year and a half, two years. I, I don't know how long something like that would take. That would be a very large task when you want to consider the, uh, the implications of attendance boundary changes, the potential of discontinuing doing transfers, uh, the potential of, uh, of, of uh, another uh, structural feasibility and study in this school district, which we haven't looked at uh, adding classrooms onto schools, admittedly, with a couple of exceptions, and I can cite those, uh, and, and what that would require and the, and the value that, uh, uh, that that would bring to you. Uh, and so I think, I think you, you're in a very uh, pretty unique position. Uh, in that you have all of the uh, information that you have around Eugene Field, uh, and and this discussion, in my mind, uh, would would likely postpone any decision around Eugene Field for the next one and a half, two, maybe even three years. It would take quite a while in order time. to facilitate this. Uh, and that's, uh, again, uh, I'm, I'm no expert on structural uh, uh, additions or engineering or, or any of that sort, but when I think of the information that you've received to this point over the last three years, and what I think, what, what I believe the public generally wants it's not what every single person in this district wants, but what the public generally wants, based upon the input you received at this point, is that I um, I don't know that you would end in a different place two or three years from now if you were to go through that process. Uh, I think you'd find yourself potentially right where you are right now. Yeah, I think it's important to remember the work of the of the task of the last couple tasks task forces, the Long Range Facilities Group, who, who their recommendations were to the, which we adopted were to um, keep all our schools, you know, not keep all our schools functioning the way they are now as best we can. We have, you know, we have a good thing going in this district. We provide parent choice. We have, I know we, you know, there's always the thing about transfers and all this stuff, but that's why people come to this district, because we, we have a good thing going with our variety of schools, with our community schools. Um, people like it the way it is. That's one thing we've we heard is don't, don't change it. I don't think we can discount the work of those task forces and what they've, what they've brought to us. Um, another thing we've heard about from our, our surveys from the last bond is <clears throat> to keep it simple, keep the, keep the cost down. Um, and I, I might, like Andy, I don't know what it would cost to add on to, to some, of the, some of the other schools. You know, I know Robert Frost would be expensive, but you're going to have to you're going to have to float a bond to do that anyway. Mm -hmm. If you're going if you're adding on, and I think, you know, for one thing, it'd, it'd be very complicated. Um, you would you would lose our industry transfer policy. That would be gone. People wouldn't have a choice anymore. They would be, you know, somebody who <clears throat> was on the outside of town but still in the in town schools is okay now you're going out here well that's not going to be a popular decision on on either side you know and in my conversations with some of the um parents in the outlying schools they don't want town kids coming out there any more than the town kids parents want them to go out there so um i just think if you you know you would have to pass a bond, it would like Andy said, it would take a long, long time to go through that process. I don't think we have that time for you for the Eugene Field problem, for one thing. And plus, if you're talking about attendance boundary changes and all this stuff, you're never going to pass a bond. I just don't think. I think people would be. It's such an emotional issue. 
I think people would be up in arms. I don't think you'd ever pass a bond to do it. Honestly. Well, if, if the goal is to have straight grades, I think that's a completely yeah. different discussion. There's, there's much more cost-effective ways to, to do that. We could combine um, Pratham and Central Hall. We could combine Evergreen and, and Victor Point, View Creek and, and Scott's Mills into one K-8 school, basically, in two <coughs> buildings, and achieve that same thing for really no cost. So if I could jump on no about no cost. Um, we're going to have to pass a bond no matter what. And I think part of my thinking is, is that we have a greater likelihood of passing a bond, um, especially given our district visioning process, which is giving us a lot of information about what uh, people in the district would like to see, what values they'd like to have honored. And especially if we do something for the entire elementary community, just as we've done for the high school age community. Um, I think we have a much better chance of passing a bond than if it's strictly an in-town solution. Well, this is not. Part, so, of, part, part of the proposal here is to go out with you know, California I realize schools. that security upgrades. Secure, security. Technology. And, and right. technology. And we have some buildings that are already full to capacity. I mean, I think a lot of, I agree with a lot of what you said, Tim, but I think a lot of what you said is just speculation based on lack of knowledge because none of us know what um, what this idea might might present. We haven't looked at it. It's pretty much a brand new idea. The idea of doing something for the entire elementary community and reconfiguring uh, attendance boundaries and adding on to schools where it's appropriate to do that. It sounds like a lot and it's really daunting. I mean, it's a new idea. New ideas always, always are. But I think it's worth looking at. For me, the most important thing to do is to do the right thing and do it once in a cost-effective way in this district rather than do something that fails, try a bond request that might fail, and then use mod modulars, which are very short-term and expensive consumption of district resources. And that option also limits what we can do for the rural elementary schools because it uses up all of our reserves. Um, it's just, you know, it's, it's complicated no matter how you cut it. But I think, I think it's a disservice to the district not to look at this other option and flesh it out. It makes a lot of sense on its face in a lot of ways. And um, it's very easy, you know, to sort of to say, you know, that this won't work or that won't work. But we don't know that until we actually... Well, I, I tend to disagree with that, too, because I think in our discussions in the last couple of years as we've been dealing with this, I mean, we've been dealing with this for a long time. And in our discussions, I think we have not specifically looked at that type of plan, but I think we have, we've looked at numbers, we've looked at costs, we've looked at all sorts of things that, that you know, that lead me to think that, that that's, it wouldn't, wouldn't be a very doable option. That's just, that's just my opinion. I've heard. And we're, we're also, you know, part of this focus is, is Eugene Field. Eugene Field is in bad shape. Everybody has, has agreed that. Every survey we've taken is like, get kids out of that building. And I don't think we can lose sight of that. I think we need to, you know, and sure, other buildings in the district have, have issues also. But you chip away at them one thing at a time. We can't do it all at once. I've said it before, you know, if we pass a bond to solve the Eugene Field problem, then we have dollars to to chip away at some of the other things. And I just don't think, I think we need to keep our highest needs in mind as we move forward also. So, okay. Anything else from down here? <laughs> Owen? Go ahead, Owen. Don't get me started. I was hoping to keep it. No. <laughs> We're waiting. Yeah, I know you are. <laughs> <laughs> I'll chime in. I thought there was a lot of, um, in reading a lot of emails from parents, there was a lot of, a lot of folks were thought going up to Robert, just expanding up to Robert Cross was good because it would allow a pick, it would they would have one less pickup and drop off. And this other solution, it, it changes the model in town. But right now you've got. K three, then Robert Frost. You know, you they go from a K three to a four, five, six to a seven, eight to the high school. Now you're a K five, six, seven, eight to the high school. You you eliminate a move, and a building and a staff gets to know a kid, a child that much longer. And I think that's 
that I think is the secret of her K8. That's why I like K8 so much because the kids, get, the staff gets the kid for eight years, well, nine years. But anyway, I, I think a lot of parents might be very attracted to that. And, and Tom, I can only cite the survey results that were done and the committee results that were done, and that was actually fairly close to split yeah. between town and, and rural schools. That the rural parents appreciated their uh, their K8 configuration, uh, and actually uh, a number of, uh, of uh, town uh, parents appreciated the, the transitions. Well, I understand, and I, I, I get yeah. the minimizing transitions. I think that's good for, for student education, too. Uh, but but uh, culturally speaking, I think in this community, some parents appreciate that. They build their students up to transition from third to fourth grade, from sixth to seventh grade, from eighth to ninth grade, of course. And, and while um, uh, well, I, I, I get that, I understand that, I, I also know that, that parents really spoke very loudly uh, alternately, oh, that, that, they, oh. that they appreciate that. I think it's a 2012 uh, task force where we had that we actually talked a lot about the transitions and, mm -hmm. and it wasn't the best for kids and yeah. so they're not as, not not to have as many tra transitions and we tried to push that a little bit and mm -hmm. heard a lot of clear from parents that are part were part of that task force that they liked it the way it was and they preferred the transitions. Yeah. I think it's important to listen to the community and. <coughs> Um, we keep hearing to keep the kids in town. Um, I do think that at this point, and the more we talk to people, that Schlater Street really is the best for middle school and not necessarily a grade school. And, you know, do it right, do it once, keep it simple, but at the same time, do it right. I mean, I think um, moving the kids around, people can people understand that, but you will upgrade Mark Twain, you will be upgrading Robert Frost, and you will be getting a fairly new school out of Schlater Street campus by using what we have in the sense of the science wing only and the gym, not anything else. We're ripping down the rest of it. Right. <laughs> but, and the <laughs> but, you know, that, this, is, this is helping three schools. It's keeping the grade configuration and the variety of grade configuration out there, and I think there's a lot of value to that. And people have really, you know, I, people I've talked to, there's an overwhelming support for the LeapFrog and the, <laughs> Schrader Street as a middle school and you know I the rough numbers we had in the scenarios originally you know it's not the absolute cheapest because of what well, in the scenarios we we yeah, see you know going just straight Eugene Field to Schlater would be the least expensive however scenario two was moving it and Eugene Field expand Robert Frost move current four or five Robert Frost students to Mark Twain six and, you know, this, that whole leapfrog thing. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, you know, I think there's a lot of support for that, and it keeps the grade configurations the way that it has been that have worked really well in our community and given options. Yeah, I agree, Julie. I think it is important to really kind of reflect back at the, on the, all of our experiences here and receiving public testimony. I'm thinking back to being on that that uh, boundary task force. And I remember proposing, because it seemed to make a lot of sense to me, not having the benefit of her been out on the school board at that time, so I was just new to the whole project. But I actually proposed that we consider combining uh, Scott's Mills and Butte Creek, because it did seem to give us straight grades. It max better, better used the, the facilities of both buildings. Um, but I tell you, that conversation lasted about 10 minutes. And the people from Butte Creek that were there, the people from Scott's Mills, were just adamant, adamantly against it. The rush community was adamantly against it because they saw that it would split, potentially split their community up amongst a couple of buildings. And it just, I mean, that was just a really, um, just a non-starter. So uh, even though there were some few people on the on the group that said, yeah, it would make a lot of sense in terms of solving some problems, it just, nobody wanted to do it. Yeah, we have had a lot of input in the last few years from the community, from different kinds of tasks. The task force groups we have put together to look at some of this stuff, we've had a lot of input, and I think we really need to keep keep that in, in our minds. Mm -hmm. What they've told us that, that the public wants, that people's opinions, I think we really need to keep that in our, in our minds. Yeah. No, Otherwise, I, I, why, why even have it? Yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I exp I'm, explore I'm constantly exploring other options because I... Like this one here, it's looking just like the last one that got shot down pretty big. It's getting expensive fast. And, and, and this is the right way to do it. I'm just trying, I'm trying to think of something that will actually get us some money. You know, um, we get these great 
recommendations, and and they're, and they're, they're good recommendations. I agree with them, but and, and I, I don't I don't mean to be glib, but there's there's not a twenty five million dollar check stamp stamp on the back of them. You know, we can't get the funds to do it. That's that's what um, that, that's the problem I keep banging my head against. And um, I think it's me looking for other ways to, to get us to get us till that big high school bond pays off, and then we can go ask you know request some good money from from the voters again maybe and, and do something nice again and do it right. I, I'm really concerned that we're we're we're, we're going to end up doing something not right, and and, and it's going to be in 20, 30 years are going to be going. Oh, what were you guys thinking? You know. We're here working on this stuff, and you know, when you do the underground plumbing or the drainage is bad or something, I just I'm really worried that we're we're going to get crunched for money. So my proposal is try to get get some numbers around. Yep. The, the scope the scope is significantly different than, than the last one. Okay. It's much smaller. Yep. But yeah. until we know what numbers we can tie each of these pieces of scope, we're just talking. Yeah. <clears throat> and the numbers could change. You know, when we get the numbers, it could change some of our ideas too. Mm -hmm. You know, it could put a whole different light on it. I just. Yeah, back to these. I just I like the way they give some direction. Oh no, I, I like them. They're good and, and they're good. They give good direction for that that, that proposal. It's great. Right. Is there what would it take to get us some numbers for this other proposal? Is there a reason? Is there a reason, is there a reason we can't? Because I wouldn't. You know, I mean, if it's if it's if it's you know, I, I'm just I, I'm just doing the kind of well, geez, what would it cost? I mean, my goodness, if it's if it's really a lot of money to save, it might have legs if it. If it's close, and forget about it. I mean, I'm not, you know. So what? What I can rely upon, Tom. And, yeah. And again, I'm not going to claim any any credit toward being yeah. an engineer or or, or a contractor. But yeah. what, what I can tell you is that the the, the work that this district has done uh, at uh, a new multiple schools related to expansion uh, or at least changes uh, uh, would uh, uh, very quickly. Uh, and I, I don't remember what the minimum percentage is, but very quickly, uh, uh, let's say if you were to add. Pick a school, Big Creek. Add three classrooms or five classrooms mm -hmm. to Big Creek School, uh, and make that a school of, of 400 students. Uh, uh, that would likely meet the threshold based upon what I understand. And, and David, we had a good conversation in the Eugene Field Task Force about this. Of what that minimum threshold is, that would require uh, a full code compliance of the remainder of, of the building. And and whether you know three or four classrooms would would require that, uh, because once it reaches a certain percentage, is what we were told at the time. Uh, once it reaches a certain percentage of the value of the building, it it, it, it requires uh, uh, upgrades to the rest of the building related to ADA and uh, okay. and electrical, and mechanical, and, and so forth. Uh, and so that kind of evaluation would be necessary at every school uh, in, in order to, to determine that scope. That's what we've done at uh, uh, at the Schlater campus, and that's some of the preliminary work we've done at Robert Frost as well as what we believe those estimated figures to be. Uh, so I think until until we specifically identify where those changes Changes would be uh, what, which buildings would be added to which buildings would be not. You'd have to have an evaluation, uh, and, and and a person could estimate those things. But there's also uh, uh, some compliance review. I'll, I'll give you some an example related to compliance review. We did uh, uh, when we uh, closed Monitor School, took a look at placing a modular at Creek School. Uh, we did contact Clackamas County about that, and Clackamas County was was very clear to us that we would have to do a traffic impact study. We were going to add a modular because that adds the potential for, depending upon whether it was one or two classrooms, 30 to 60 kids. So there would be a, a traffic impact study done uh, there. They said preliminarily it would likely increase the size of the drain field in the school. Uh, there would be also be some, some other concerns related to, um, uh, to other compliance that we just didn't dig into because we discovered very quickly that there was some expense to that that we hadn't anticipated. Uh, and, and so that's a view creep. Uh, my sense is that would be the same at Scotts Mills, uh, the same at Victor Point. Uh, Evergreen and, and, and Pratham, uh, those those schools hold 80 kids. Uh, you know, there's there's one way to get straight grade configuration at Evergreen and Pratham, and that's to combine those schools with neighboring schools. Yeah. Uh, similar to Owen's comment a little while ago, uh, I think you've had boardrooms full of people uh, from Evergreen and Pat Pratham in the past when there's been consideration about changes at those two schools, as any K-8 school would. Uh, and, and so, uh, again, I think, uh, I think the consideration just has so many implications. Uh, even coming up with a basic estimate, I, I think, would require a considerable amount of time in order to determine what that scope even looks like, and could we even do it, and then once we determine what that scope could look like, then getting in and doing some of the structural evaluation, visiting with Clackamas or Marion County, finding 
know what the code compliance rules would be with that. It's uh, the, the balance here in my in my mind, uh, uh, respectfully to each one of you, the balance is you have a pressing need with Eugene Field School, uh, and are you as a board willing to put that need aside for two or three more years, uh, potentially? Because uh, it's surely, in my mind, it's going to take longer than a year uh, in order to determine what the rest of this district could look like, or the entire district could look like, with with changes that you're discussing here. And you know, also, if we're going to spend money, why in the world would we spend dollars on schools on the, on the edges of the school district when we have the the population in town here? Yeah, the parents want their kids to go go to school closer to home, yeah. not not the other end of the district. It, well, it's like I said, and, and not to be glib, but we don't have a twenty-five million dollar check yet to spend. That's, I mean, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't mean to look on that. And, and, and also, um, but when, Tom, I think when, you're looking at at least a $25 million check to add on to everything maybe else, so. too. Yeah. <laughs> and I think Andy brings up a good point with, um, you know, you start talking about closing the Pratimer and Evergreen or combining yeah. those schools. You know, we're filled up with, the, with parents for those schools. The same yeah. way if we start talking about attendance boundary changes and moving kids, say, from town schools to to outline schools or moving outline school kids to town, which could happen. You're going to, it's going to be very unpopular. Popular. You're going to have as many parents from the town schools as you are when you talk about changing an outline school because parents from the town schools care as much about their schools and like their, their configurations as much as they do now. And I go, I just go back to the fact that we have a good thing going in this district. This district has a lot of positive things with our configurations now, a lot of choice. Um, why change, why, if it's not broke, why try to fix something that isn't broke? I like what Julie said about listening to the community also. So. Yeah, no, I understand. I, and I don't, and I don't talk about moving boundaries lightly. I, I, I went, I, I went to modern grade school the building closed. I mean, that's, that's where I went to school at. So my alma mater got, got closed and it caused some boundary changes to where my kids are going to school now at Scotts Mill. So I, I know what I, I understand when I speak those words about boundary changes and it being very emotionally. I've, I've been there and I've done that. I, I know what I talk about. So, I mean, I, I, I don't say that lightly and, and I know that people who are hearing this are probably going, oh my God, I got you. But I, mean, I, I know what I speak I, and I don't, I don't say it lightly. I'm just, you know, it is, I'm just, my, my, my instincts are telling me that this bond is getting very, very expensive again. And I'm looking for other solutions. So, can I jump back in? Yes, I'm done. <laughs> so, we've had a lot of conversation here about, uh, about the past, about task forces that were put together to address problems or issues here in the past. But uh, we made a decision now that moves us toward the future. And I think in the process of making that decision and the process of the last failed bond. Um, request. There's been an enormous amount of education uh, with the voters in this district, and I really reject the idea that the voters in this district have to have a dirt simple option. I think that they can sort out the complexities of an option that makes sense uh, fiscally and educationally for the students. And I think that if we can present that to them, that you'll get really a good response to a bond request. I think if we don't do that, um, we may be back in the same position. So if you're talking about not being able to fix Eugene Field, or I mean not being able to replace it, um, we may be right back in that same mode and lose time again. So I also want to say I, I just don't think that it's a fair comparison, even off the cuff, to talk about uh, traffic issues at Butte Creek School, which is right next to a major highway, and compare it to Scotts Mill School, which uh, really sits kind of back in a little alcove and doesn't have any of the, the traffic issues that the state would be looking at um, with expansion there. I mean, to me, that's the logical, kind of a logical place to make that kind of, a, of an expansion uh, for the future, especially given that Scotts Mills is a town. Um, and, you know, attendance boundary changes, sound, it sounds like a wholesale upset to the district, but it's not that at all. If you moved students from one, it, it basically you're just shifting the edge of boundaries a little bit. I'm not, sorry, I don't mean to scare you. Um, you know, so you're talking about uh, North, Av North Avoqua students going to theoretically, potentially, uh, an expanded Scotts Mill School versus coming into town. 
um, you're not really taking the town kids out of town and putting them way out in the country. You're shifting some kids that live in the country already over to another school. <coughs> setting. So I, I just think, once again, that the, there's a lot of speculation about something that we really haven't fleshed out, that we really haven't studied, and we don't know that much about. I'm wondering, um, maybe a question for both David and Tom, because I, I don't want to misunderstand either of you. Are you thinking primarily about cost effectiveness of a different solution? And I see Tom shaking his head, yes. And, or are you thinking primarily about program um, advantages to, to the education? Yes and yes. Yes and yes. yes? I think in my mind it would be both. Yeah, I've been thinking about this a lot since this, this issue was broached publicly, I think, um, for the first time in a board meeting at our last regular meeting. And I think, for myself at least, the more I think about it, and the more I get input from other people who have started to think about it, it makes, it makes a lot of sense, at least on its face. And it makes sense if we're going to be uh, taking such a major step um, to at least investigate it, see what we're talking about. See what the, the possibilities are. I also think it's important to not lose sight of the <clears throat> problems at Eugene Field, and that that's our major, major problem right now. Well, we made that future. decision, so I, I don't, I'm not. Yes, trying. but I'm not willing to push that off for another possibly five years, whatever it would be. So, so. just a question, kind of in response to that, if, if we end up uh, going with your plan B, which is if we can't pass a bond, putting modulars at the site, at the Schlater Street site, and expending all of the district's resources, all of our savings, whatever we need to take out of the general fund, to do a short-term and expensive option, um, what about the other schools, the three schools, two of them rural schools that have significant life and safety issues with the seismic integrity of those buildings. And I'm talking about Butte Creek School, uh, Central Hall School, and Mark Twain Elementary here. I under, middle school. And I understand all that and all those issues. Um, you know, we've, we've talked about modulars. We don't know if that's where we would end up. We would have to reevaluate. But I, you know, and, and David, you mentioned about you don't think that you think that the vote. You don't think that the vote. The, sim, the simplicity of the thing. You don't think that something about the way people understand it. You want me to I'm not getting it up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't think. I mean, there's a lot of talk about a simple option. And what I said. I know that what I said um, at the board meeting is pretty caustic. But I don't think it's the voters um, that couldn't understand yeah. the complexity of the last the last presentation, the last program that we presented with a bond request, I think it's that the board couldn't make sense of it in trying to present it to the voters. It wasn't the complexity of it. It's yeah. just that the more okay. voters looked at it, the more they said, what are you guys doing? What the heck is this? And I think now that we've had this educational period and people are, we've made the decision about Eugene Field, um, I think the voters can sort it out if we have a, a really good program that's fiscally sound and educationally sound and takes us into the future. Um, just one, one more quick thing and I'll shut up. I was, um, I was at meetings in Salem here a couple weeks ago and the state's about to put our feet to the fire along with every other district in the state uh, as far as common core standards and achievement expectations. Uh, we've had kind of a little respite, a little uh, adjustment period here now, but they're talking about things like interventions um, and some pretty heavy-duty uh, things. We're, we've had the carrot, now we're going to get the stick, I think. So I think it's really important that we look at the issues of student achievement and the best that we can do for our students educationally. That's a big part of our responsibility as a school board, not just uh, replacing buildings and and raising money. Okay. Um, just on the last part of that, student achievement is always at the top of the list. It's never just about replacing buildings. We're talking about one thing that we've talked about with the problems at Eugene Field, how that relates to student achievement. And that is, you can't deny that. You can't deny that, the problem with that building. And you talk, also talked about the complexity. I would agree. I don't think it's necessarily the complexity, complexity of the last bond or the, you know, the, the leapfrogging of kids that it's been blamed that the failure's been blamed on. I think the bond was too expensive for one thing, 
and we didn't we didn't have a have everything planned like we should have. I totally agree with that. But along those same lines, I also think, and I hear I hear you guys talking about, oh, we may not pass a bond, we may not pass a bond. I have heard so much. There is so much energy already behind behind this. There is so much energy out there. I every day I talk to people who say, keep moving, keep moving. You're doing the right thing. Get kids out of Eugene's people. I. I think voters understand the issues with that building, and I think I think we get a bond, a bond passed. I heard one of the one of the people who was on the the last PAC committee supporting the um, um, promoting that last bond said, "You guys are already ahead of where we were three days before the election." So I just I don't know. That's count me wrong, but I think there's a lot more. Positive stuff out there than negative. So. Andy to David's questions around these seismic upgrades. I think there's going to be some work going on in grants. Uh, Can you yes, yes, we'll, 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 we'll be submitting at least one uh, a grant application, if not potentially two, uh, relying on ZCS to help us out with mm -hmm. that. But those that timeline is this summer. We just went to <clears throat> excuse me a grant workshop uh, on Thursday of last week uh, by um, uh, related to the state seismic grant, and we believe we have two. Two good candidates in our district, yeah, uh, between Butte Creek, Creek, Creek and Mark Twain. Twain. Those are your two top priorities, no doubt. But based upon the ZCS engineering report, anyway. Well, I could be wrong, but my my first take here on, on all this is I just don't I I just don't see getting widespread support for the proposal. Now, you, you might be right. We might be able to come up with such a strong proposal that. that that you convince enough people, but just my my experience in growing up in a in a you know evergreen district, I don't think it's probably that far off of probably any of the other rural districts. And, and hearing the conversations that I've I've heard since being on the board and and whatnot, I just don't see a lot of support for that. Um, it, it just seems like it doesn't take very much for a person to vote no, and if it's I don't want my kid to go there. I'm scared about this change here. That um, I don't know. I just it would be a really hard thing uh, to get past. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I, I don't doubt that it would be difficult. We may get a lower number, lower number, and maybe even some program. Um, you know, some good, hopefully, some good program reasons that we wouldn't present it anyway. But. Um, you know, we may just exchange one <clears throat> for another. So. Yeah, yeah. Both of these proposals would involve adding a pod to Robert Frost, so we so so that cost is, is common. Only if we did the the K eight or the six eight of Schlatter. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I guess I'm just um, which we could scope yeah. out as well. I mean, I'm certainly open to adding that to my my. Uh, Proposal. Oh, I thought we were going to get ideas for both of both the K three and the six eight over here. That that was my intention, but um, yeah. I'm hearing a lot yeah. of discussion about Robert Frost, and, and and to do that that would allow us to do the the uh, six eight at Rock, at uh, Schlater here. Yeah, to do, I, I'm under, I, if I understand right, I think to do maybe I missed the numbers, but to do a six to make a, to make Schlater into a six eight means we'd have to add a pod to Robert Frost. You would have to add classroom space to Robert Frost. That's right. I'm yeah, up to a full pod, right. uh, Tom, but I guess it depends on what that, what again, what the programming looks like at this building, what the programming looks like at, right. at Robert That's Frost. to move Eugene Field to Robert Frost. <laughs> Correct. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. And so that's that's a commonality of the two plans. And so the difference would be... What other plan? The Well, the, the proposal. The well, if you're role, making... David and I's role. If you're making Robert Frost a K-5, you're going to have to add on a whole lot more than... One no, five. because it would be a K-5, and the one that didn't fit would just boundaries and put them in the rural buildings. And that's the controversy. So it's not a proposal or a plan. It's an idea. Mm -hmm. But I think, yeah, for myself, it's an idea that has some merit. And since it was first floated, there's been increasing discussion, at least with people that have contacted me about that. So I guess yeah. the last thing I'd like to say is that you know our district visioning plan speaks very forcefully and at some length to the need to unify the district, to truly unify the district and the thinking of the district into one district 
some decades after or a decade and a half after consolidation and sort of debalkanize the district. And I think if we can achieve that, uh, even if the plan is complicated, takes a little more time, uh, we can really do some great things in this district. One other, and one other thing that I remember the consultants who are doing our visioning process came back to us with, after they did all their community meetings, one of the, the things that they most strongly came back was that they said people do not want change. People do not want to keep the case the way they are. I remember, I remember that distinctly. They said don't change the schools. That was the one thing they, that they came back with that with us. So anyway, any, yeah. any other? We can move along. If I, I, just, I, just, I just want to repeat again for those watching, I've been through boundary changes. It's emotional. It stinks. I, I, I know what I see. <laughs> been there, done that. And I got the, I got the, but I got the bumper sticker, and so I don't, I don't float that lightly. So, got the T-shirt. I guess I'm gonna say. <laughs> so. My experience with that is that the parents got more emotional than the kids. <laughs> the kids went to school, and it's like, <laughs> okay, you can go home now, Dad. <laughs> so. Yeah. Okay, moving on. Reviewed draft district timeline for possible November 2014 bond election. Andy, do you want to? Yeah, you, you've, each of you have received a copy of this uh, at your last meeting, and it was uh, it's with the intent of, if, if you chose to uh, authorize a resolution to place a, a, an election on the November 4th ballot, and you, you began with the November 4th ballot and worked backwards, so I put in front of you a draft timeline of, of more, more of the global tasks that would be required. There'd be some very specific tasks that would be required as well, but uh, as you, you'd have to have your ballot title and, and measure submitted to the county elections department by September 4th, so 60 days ahead of time. Uh, and if you were to do that by September 4th, then, then you would have to uh, authorize a resolution uh, sometime in August because it would it would take it would take a week or two to get that all that information put together and placed in, in, in the county elections department. So, so that's a uh, that's a draft uh, a schedule in front of you. Uh, and if you if you step back even further uh, and go uh, to where we are right now, May and June, uh, you'll see that. Uh, uh, in fact, I think this lends itself somewhat to your conversation tonight, all of you for that matter, and that is uh, related to uh, uh, program or project management. In other words, uh, having bringing someone on board that could uh, take the information that you currently have, and you have a lot of it, uh, and put that together in a package so you could flesh out better what, what an anticipated bond amount could look like. It, it, using uh, uh, using uh, uh, conversion of the Schlater campus to another school. Uh, uh, I don't have the expertise to do that. We need to bring people on to do that. And when, when you do that, you do that through an RFP process. And that's also one of your agenda items to, to, tonight is for you just to take a look at the timeline and, and basic information related to that RFP. But uh, I, uh, I think there's merit to getting that additional information because I think it will answer some of your questions. Uh, and it will it will help uh, solidify what the cost to convert the Schlater campus will, uh, and the cost to modify the uh, Robert Frost or even Mark Twain campus would be for the purposes of this. You haven't made the decision to put a bond on, on the ballot, uh, but uh, uh, but obtaining additional information about the, your current train of thought, or at least the majority of you, uh, related to the, the use of the Schlater Street campus, I think in my mind, would be very helpful information for this body to either make a decision or to choose to do something else. Well, I'd like to point out on your timeline here, July 14th, you have defined project scope and anticipated project bond amount. It's be very quick. That's only seven or eight weeks away. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of work to be done. And I, that's why I think we really need to get our arms around these, these different scenarios as quickly as possible so we can see if we can determine what the scope really will be. Yeah. And, and, and I, I agree, Wally. Uh, and again, I, uh, I also know that what, what you've done over the, uh, with, with all of the work that you did with the last bond election, and this, this costs you money, so we're, I mean, we're trying to be as attentive to not uh, uh, spending a, a ton of money on this, that's for sure, but it does cost you money in order for you to come up with the, the scope and objectives for a project like this. And to bring someone on board really is the, uh, is the only way in my mind to do that, because we don't have that expertise. Yeah. So we so we hire somebody to do that work. Correct. Yeah. You got a rough dollar amount. What that would cost? Just just, uh, just just. I think if we if we use uh, the comparison of the last project manager that you hired that did a lot of pre-planning work, mm -hmm. uh, my sense is this could be in the, the ten to fifteen thousand dollar range. 
So discussion on the timeline. So that brings us to the um, discussion about the, the RFP, re the request for proposals. I think it's a good place to get started, bring somebody on who has the knowledge and expertise to flush some of this stuff out. With quite a few legal requirements for an RFP like this, and, and they're, they're described there, especially with the, the, the calendar and uh, and um, uh, the RFP itself is about 22, 23 pages, I believe, uh, and it contains a lot of uh, legal information that, that, that legal counsel has helped us put together. Joel uh, Smallwood uh, also has some, some pretty significant uh, experience with, with RFPs and has reviewed this as well uh, and provided some updates. So I, um, uh, is this it, it's, an, it's an effective tool. Is it something we need to formally vote on yeah. to approve or just? Well, you, the, the, the action that you took to, you know, you surely can, but the action you took to approve the recommendations helps kickstart okay. this and get in place, and we, you need some additional information in order to make an informed decision. Yeah, I guess. Okay. Okay. Anything else, guys? Okay. And you would take formal action. I'm sorry to interrupt him. You would take formal action on the actual um, selection. Yes. At that point. Yeah. Okay. Okay, potential board meeting dates, additional work sessions, <laughs> summer extended work session. We took the retreat out of that one time. And then, um, additional work sessions. Are you looking to schedule some tonight, <laughs> or are you just warning us that do we? <laughs> well, there might be additional ones. We can warn that. Guess. But yeah, I would guess. I'm, yeah, I'm ready. Um, so. Did you? Did you think we need to schedule anything, Andy, or wait yeah, till? Your, ne your next meeting, you've got Memorial Day coming up for next week, and that's why you're having the meeting tonight instead of next Monday. Uh, and uh, the, the, the RFP will be published by then, and uh, hopefully we'll be re receiving. So I, I don't know that you'll have uh, a ton of re uh, a need to, to meet uh, prior to your next meeting, which is, which is June 9th, but I would encourage you to uh, be prepared to, to meet potentially the following Monday, the 16th, based upon the information that you've received by that time, uh, and uh, and potentially even um, potentially even meet every week uh, beyond that if, if this board were to choose to move ahead with the uh, November election, at least over in that period of June when you get uh, between June and, and July and, and August. Uh, to decide a specific scope. I think at least leave those options available to you uh, in order to, uh, to make your decisions. Okay, let's tentatively schedule an extra work session for June 16th then. Oops. Is that the right date? The for that, that's what I mean. Okay. Yes. Let's tentatively schedule that. We can pin it down for sure at our regular session in June. But let's all so kind, just of, tentative right now. kind of plan I, on it. I question right now if we'll have anything solidified to talk about then as well, but we can decide. We can decide at the next meeting, yeah. Okay. I, I will be going on the 16th. Okay. Okay. Keep it in the back of your minds. Um, summer extended work session, that's something we usually do in August. Yeah, we did that in the third third week of August, the last, uh, last summer, and I think it was a similar weekend the, uh, the year prior. It's, it's, it's your decision, but I've, I've found those four-hour sessions to be very helpful. Uh, and did you get some good conversation in and, and, uh, and, and also have opportunity to have some uh, additional training or maybe some direction specific to whatever the board would like to have that evening? So given the fact that we're going to have so many uh, special work sessions and we've done the district visioning process, is it really, do you think it's really necessary that this one year only, you uh, might not have additional training. And I would say we don't need any training. Well, we probably need training. <laughs> maybe we don't. I'm sure we need training, but maybe we can put that off for. Well, actually, we could use that time to yeah. do some of the work that's so required. I, I would have broke it up. We're going to have a, a tremendous amount of work. Yeah, and especially if we um, extremely ambitious bond timeline. If we have, um, we'll go forward. If we have, you know, meetings, break work sessions more often, I, I would propose we just kind of wait till July and see what if we need to have an extended one in August or just continue on with our weekly meetings. Sure, no problem. 
Maybe not weekly, but <laughs> it is summer. Whatever we can do at summer, and I've yeah, got another wedding I'm planning for this. <laughs> summer. Okay. Denise here's weekly meetings. <laughs> okay. Okay. Anything else on those? I Oops. just like. Oh, I just like to add on the. You know, we're, we're looks like we're going to be voting on the. The um, proposals. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so. I I I, I can count to five. Um, <laughs> so if, if if we add that the the add to that add the, the what it costs to add that pod up to Robert Frost in the cafeteria. Because that would be kind of part of the basis of this other proposal. That would be good information if, for some reason, we start adding all this stuff up and it gets expensive, and we want to explore that. That's good information for that other proposal. Because okay. this is a good scope of work for for the Slater. I think it's really How would you add that on, Wally? Just yeah. just to include, have a number seven add uh, pod and cafe and and uh, play area to Robert Frost. I think I agree. I think it's we're kind of creating a menu here that would help us understand the scope of the cost. Okay. That's kind of a question that's kind of been bounced around for. Yeah. For Everybody asks that question. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. So well, that's good. How, what did you put, Andy or Wally, for number seven? Um, add pod, cafeteria, and covered play area to Robert Frost. Okay, so that would be uh, number seven. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have an action item consideration of these proposals for the use of Schlater. Is there a motion? <clears throat> sure, I'll move my motion. You want me to read it? Yeah, go ahead. So, B, to give the district direction to develop scope and cost for projected bond potentially targeted for the November election. That would uh, do the following. Remove the old three-story section of the Slater Street campus. Remove the Ag Science Building. Remodel and upgrade the remaining single-story structures on the Slater Street campus. Infill the Slater, Slater Street campus with new construction to provide new educational space. Provide safety and security upgrades to all the district uh, school buildings that are used for students for our various consultants' reports. Uh, provide technology updates to our buildings and add a at Robert Frost, add a pod, cafeteria, and covered play area. I second it. Okay. Any further comments? Just a question about the um, proposal for security upgrades at the rural elementary schools. Uh, when we talked about that, we looked at a whole range of options. Is that what we're going to do here, is look at kind of everything that the consultants suggested and then pick from those? Because some of them were, we looked at and we said, you know, why would we do that? Sure. And some of the discussion came back to, you know, for example, one of the most effective things that you can do and one of the least costly um, is to have security cameras at your schools. I mean, it's both a deterrent and uh, an opportunity to know what's going on. My so, expectation would be the high impact ones. We also talk about fencing. Fencing is needed at several of the schools. Um, locks on doors. We talk about wind at a couple of schools. We talk about windows at the classrooms. So, so, so we'll have an opportunity to look at all those options. I would think as so. Sort of a menu, and then mm -hmm. sort out in a bigger conversation what we think is most appropriate. That'd Maybe be my up, expectation. Yeah. Okay. Maybe update the work that was done before or something. Okay. 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 And we have those. And, and well, I am sorry. Sure. We have uh, we have three of the, the fencing projects completed at the rural schools at this point, and, and hope to have the rest of those finished with the next okay. couple months. Perfect. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Awesome. And one more action item. We have a new principal coming to Silvercrest and Victor Point Schools. Jamie McCarty, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, and I'd like to introduce Jamie. He's here tonight. Jamie, could you I'm please? I'm glad I carried it. <laughs> Yeah, you. You, do you want to say anything? Or? I, I look forward There's to only it. one other principal here, so you won't get stuck buying donuts. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody timing you. <laughs> that, was, that was a lot of fun to watch, and, and I look forward to it. So, good to have you here, Jamie. We've heard good things, so good to have you. <laughs> okay, no other business. We're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.